Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us on this beautiful morning in June. Um, I'm Philip Lohaus. I'm a research fellow here in National Security Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. And um, welcome to our guest, not so new building, um, but still new-ish. Um, and we're really happy we were able to squeeze you all in here and that there's such interest in the event. I'm going to go ahead and kick us off and give a few admin notes, and then we're going to jump right into the panel. So today in Singapore, international leaders have joined together to discuss uh, future security challenges facing the region. Apropos of the U.S. Pacific Command's recent name change to the Indo-Pacific Command, um, IPACOM or Indo-PACOM, not really quite sure which it is yet. Um, at any rate, they have Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, providing opening remarks. In fact, I think he just concluded his remarks. The rest of the conference's agenda is full of references to international competition, how to describe it, what to do about it, and how to win it. The term competition has recently come into fashion as a way of describing the state of international relations, not just in the Asia-Pacific region, but also beyond it. In addition to the Shangri-La Dialogue, it's also mentioned throughout the, the recent, recently issued national security strategy and national defense strategy. Competition among states is hardly new. In fact, it ref reflects an immutable reality of our international system. So why has this term become so popular? Well, simply stated, it reflects a new understanding of regional security. For decades after the Second World War, America's hub-and-spoke system of Pacific alliances was undergirded by unquestioned military power and the absence of a serious challenger to that order. Regional primacy in the diplomatic, informational, military, and economic senses of the word was largely uncontested. Well, that's simply no longer the case. Many see China's military modernization efforts or its willingness to build military bases in contested waters as evidence of its growing regional clout. But China also pulls on economic, legal, and psychological levers to influence and persuade. From an American perspective, these mechanisms are largely outside the purview of the military, but should they be? Others point to North Korea's nuclear program and see a propitious time to negotiate for denuclearization. The brokerage of such an agreement, if genuine, would be nothing short of monumental. But if such an agreement hinged on the removal of American forces from South Korea, how would that impact not only our regional security posture, but also our diplomatic relations with proximate allies. In East Asia and elsewhere, cross-functional security dynamics have challenged the effectiveness of America's responses. Rather than determining which di diplomatic, informational, military, or economic instrument suits each occasion, we should rather consider how to coordinate all available tools to create strategic impacts in each of these dimensions. At stake in this competition are starkly different visions for the future of the Asia-Pacific region. Today, to help us think through the military's role in this hyper-competitive environment, we're joined by four distinguished panelists. First, we have Roger Cliff, an East Asia Security, uh, East Asia Security Affairs Analyst with the Center for Naval Analyses. Next, we have uh, Nathan Fryer, uh, Associate Professor of National Security S Studies with the Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College. Following him, we'll, we'll hear from Lieutenant General Chip Gregson, retired from the U.S. Marine Corps, and also a previous Assistant Secretary of Defense for Asia and Pacific Affairs. And to round things out, we'll have my AEI colleague, Thomas Donnelly, a prolific writer and former member of the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. Just a couple of administrative notes before we get started. Each panelist is going to provide about five minutes of opening remarks, after which point we'll jump into a moderated discussion. And uh, following Mr. Donnelly's comments, um, We'll also have, Q and after the moderated discussion, we'll also jump into Q&A. If you have a question, please wait to be addressed, and we'll have an AI staff member provide you with a mic, and please try to keep your preambles to a minimum. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Mr. Clark. Thanks, Philip. Um, and <clears throat> uh, I was asked to provide some context for today's discussion by talking about uh, the view of the of the regional competition from the perspective of Beijing. And uh, so as a classically trained China Sinologist, if you will, I will uh, attempt to do that and I will do it in a necessarily Sinocentric way. And um, I'd like to actually uh, go back almost 100 years ago to the founding of the Communist Party of China in 1921. And since that time, the mission of the CPC and, and really of every other, uh, virtually every other political movement in China since the late 19th century has been uh, what uh, these days is called the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, which means the restoration of China to its historical status as one of the most powerful, wealthy, and advanced 
nations in the world, if not the most powerful, wealthy, and advanced nation in the world. Now, after taking over China in 1949, uh, the, for the first couple of decades, the CPC had a couple of what we can politely call maybe false starts, um, like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution. But since the late 1970s, um, China has experienced a period of sustained growth that is on a scale that is unprecedented in human history. The result of that is China's economy is now the second largest in the world, at least, and by some measures uh, now larger than that of the United States. As a consequence of this, at the uh, uh, Chinese Communist Party's five-year Congress last fall, uh, top leader Xi Jinping was able to declare that China has entered a new period in its development and that China is ready to move toward the center of of uh, the, the, he said, center stage in world affairs. Um, but the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation involves more than just having a big economy. For China to fully recover its past glory, it must also become a technological and cultural leader in the world, have military power commensurate with its size and economic might, and be the dominant political actor in the region. And there is some unfinished business. One of the consequences of China's period of weakness um, that uh, began in the 19th century was the loss of control over much of China's territory. Now, since the end of World War II, the Japanese have been expelled, the foreign concessions that had been set up in the late 19th and early 20th century um, are gone and uh, Manchuria has been recovered. Tibet was recovered in 1950. Hong Kong and Macau were returned in 1997 and 1999. However, um, there, as I said, there's a couple of unfinished pieces, the most important of which is um, that the nationalist government, which was otherwise defeated in 1949, has retained or did retain control over the island of Taiwan. And uh, to this day, although the nationalist government is no longer in control, Taiwan and its 23 million inhabitants do remain outside of the control of the central government in Beijing. And then there's also some small islands in the South China Sea that you may have heard about that from Beijing's perspective, should belong to China, but that other countries have been seizing control of over the years. So the, the Chinese Communist Party has a fair amount of work to do before they can claim to fully restore the Chinese nation. Um, but given China's economic development over the past four decades, China's leaders really see w only one thing other than internal upheaval that could prevent them from achieving their goal. And uh, that's another way of saying that they see their primary competitor and uh, potential adversary as the United States. Um, in fact, most Chinese leaders and observers not only believe that the United States could prevent China's return to greatness, they believe that the United States is actively working to do so. Much of China's strategy toward the outside world therefore, is designed to avoid such an outcome. Part of that strategy is an effort to develop key technological capabilities um, so that China is no longer dependent on the United States and its allies for things like microelectronics, computer software, or machine tools. Part of it is China's efforts to diversify its uh, sources of key resources, most, uh, most importantly, oil so that it is not vulnerable to an embargo or blockade. Um, and China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative that has been receiving a lot of attention in uh, the last few years is part of this as well. The goal of the Belt and Road Initiative is to increase China's integration with Asia, Africa, and parts of Europe uh, that are not aligned with the United States so that, the, so that China's uh, economy is no longer as dependent 
on uh, having good relations with the United States and its allies. And of course, China's military buildup, which we've seen over the last two decades is part of this as well. Now, in the early years of this process, the Chinese military was really focused on acquiring capabilities that were optimized for regional employment, things like mobile ballistic missiles, land-based aircraft, diesel electric submarines, and so on, that enabled China to get more bang for its buck so long as the conflict occurred in its backyard, while at the same time the U.S., uh, in the event of a conflict with, with China, would have been constrained by the limited number of bases it has, uh, the relatively small numbers of forces it has in the region normally, and the fact that the United States would have to project its power uh, over thousands of miles. Now, however, we are seeing a shift. The Chinese military is starting to challenge us at our own game and even hoping to leapfrog past us. China's first domestically built aircraft carrier is now in the water, and more and bigger carriers are on the way. China is also building uh, what they call destroyers, although they weigh over 10,000 tons and are larger than U.S. Aegis-class cruisers. Um, they've developed a strategic airlift aircraft and are working on a strategic bomber, and they have fifth-generation stealth fighters as well. Uh, perhaps even more importantly, China is investing heavily in the next generation of military technologies, things like hypersonic missiles, high-energy lasers, rail guns, and all manner of autonomous vehicles. Now, uh, China's leaders do not seek a fight with the United States. Indeed, from their study of history, they believe that the only thing that can prevent China's rise is, in fact, conflict with the United States. Their concern, however, is that such that external events, such as a move toward independence by Taiwan uh, or something else that happened that's outside of their control, could force their hand and force them uh, to engage in conflict. And they also worry that the United States will use its military superiority to contain and stifle China. We use the word containment as a relatively benign thing. It's not seen that way in Beijing. Um, and so as a result, although they envision using their military forces for other purposes, the primary goal of China's military development efforts now and for the foreseeable future is going to be to reach parity with the United States and eventually surpass us in military capability, at least within the East Asia region. And let me stop there and turn things over to Nate to talk about his study. Great, thanks. So um, first of all, um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here today. And I, I wanna say uh, right up front, I'm here representing uh, a team of uh, four faculty and seven students actually that spent the last year um, on a project looking at the, the state of competition and advantage in the, in the now um, Indo-Pacific Command's area of responsibility. So happy Indo-Pacific Command Day to everybody. <laughs> um, uh, let me just thank also uh, AEI. AEI has been great partners uh, for the year. Phil Lowhouse, uh, Tom Donnelly, Mackenzie Eglin, the, the Ware Center for Security Studies, and, and AEI in general have been great partners in this pro pro process that we've undertaken over the last year um, in, in looking at competition and advantage in, in, in Indo-Pacific Command. Um, and so I just want to you know, publicly thank you and also publicly uh, thank my team that, uh, back in Carlisle that was involved in, in, this, in this study. So we're currently wrapping up the study and the report. The report will come, up, come out later in the summer, but I wanted to actually seize the opportunity to, to bring a handful of key insights to this, um, to this body um, to, to sort of run out what we found in the, in the course of the year. But first, a little background. The study we conducted this year on uh, competition and advantage in, in, in the Indo-Pacific is really uh, the culmination of two previous works that we undertook over the previous two years, 2015, 2016, 2016, 2017, and now into this year. The first, uh, the first in the series that we did was, uh, the report ultimately was titled Outplayed, 
and that talked about gray zone challenges. I mean, we, we had um, essentially picked up through the, you know, through the defense, you know, um, ecosystem that it was wrestling with a problem to them that was not necessarily new, but that was different than that which they had been focused on in the past. Um, and so we spent a year looking at gray zone challenges and, 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 and found um, in that process that uh, all roads led back to the Pacific as far as what the most substantial gray zone challenge was, right? Um, in, the, in that work, we essentially said gray zone challenges, you know, what, what marks a gray zone challenge? You know, first is hybridity. Second, is it a menace to defense convention? I mean, does it actually um, challenge the way we think about competition and conflict? And the third, does it create risk confusion in the part of decision makers? And risk confusion is the, the, the idea that the risk of the hazards associated with action and the hazards associated with inaction when faced with this kind of competition appear to be equally unpalatable, right? So, uh, so that was sort of the culmination of, uh, of that work. We followed on the next year and we recognized, first we recognized in, in, the, in the gray zone work, we recognized that we had fundamentally misjudged in the, in the years since the end of the Cold War, we had fund, fundamentally misjudged the evolution of competition with, our, with great power rivals. That was, that was sort of a big takeaway from that, from that uh, gray zone work. The second year we took on risk and how DOD in particular, the Department of Defense, looks at, looks at the concept of risk. And essentially it became these, these <coughs> unintentionally, these studies began to actually, one led to another. If we actually had fundamentally misjudged the character of competition and conflict in the contemporary environment, um, then you know, we started from the position in the risk study in uh, 2016 and 2017, we started from the perspective that if we were mis mis misjudging competition and conflict, we're certainly, we're certainly misjudging risk as a result of that. Um, and so we spent the, the, the entire year, uh, the, you know, last year, looking at risk. One important point that came out of that risk study and I think is, uh, Chip will remember this because uh, Chip was involved in our senior review group when we, when we uh, actually run, ran the results out to test them. One of the main topics that came out, or one of the main themes that came out of that risk study was this idea of post-primacy. The United States had entered what we called a post-primacy environment, which was not that, which was not to indicate that the United States had lost, right, in some way, but the United States was going to have to work harder and smarter to maintain its position in the in the competitive environment that they had entered. So, that, so both of those studies, in effect, all roads led, back, led to the Pacific and led to Asia when we looked at those studies. When we looked at the Gray Zone Challenge, uh, uh, the PRC was one of uh, four sort of pacing Gray Zone um, case studies that we looked at. When we looked at risk, it was clear that you know, we needed to have pacing challenges to look at, and obviously in, the post in what we called the post-primacy environment, that the PRC was going to be a principal pacing rival or competitor as we, as we went forward. So um, we also, if all roads led back to the Pacific, one other thing that we actually came to was there had been two, since 2000, there had been two half-hearted or incomplete rebalances, refocus, uh, refocusing, uh, reorienting, whatever you want to call it. There had been two sort of ineffective or, or less than effective uh, reorientations on the Pacific AOR. In 2001, with the first Bush Quadrennial Defense Review, if you, read that, if you read that QDR, with the exception of all the finding and replacing that went on in the, with the Microsoft Word document to, to put ter terrorism in there as much as possible, um, because you know, the, the, the QDR was actually published on the 19th of September, 2001, uh, with the exception of that, that QDR was fundamentally about a refocus on the Asia-Pacific region. Um, it just so happened that we faced a national emergency in the period between the time we did the study, or the, we did the QDR, and the time we published the QDR. And so as a result of that, um, that was the first we'd call incomplete refocus or reorientation on the PACOM AOR. Uh, in 2012, uh, you had the the you know, Obama administration's rebalance to the Asia-Pacific region. It identified the Asia-Pacific region and not surprisingly the Middle East as the two priority regions uh, for the United States. But again, um, as, as we looked at the problem, again, there was sort of, it was not necessarily, and I don't mean to grade your homework, by the way, Chip, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but it was not necessarily seen as a complete, you know, as, as complete 
a rebalance is probably was necessary given the nature of the competitive environment. So that just gives you a little background. The current study we're working on and finishing up now, we had the gracious support of UserPAC, uh, Paycom, and, and, and PACAF to take a look at it at, at, at the Paycom AOR, or the I, IPAC, as I want to call it, AOR. Um, and we answered a simple question, what are the fundamentals for creating advantage uh, in a new, more competitive environment in the PACOM Indo-Pacific AOR. And in light of uh, those fundamentals, where do we currently stand with respect to the priority and pacing rivals in that region? So I'm going to give you five quick insights, and I'm going to get off the stage. Uh, insight number one, uh, there are really two contests that are likely to determine US competitive, the U.S. competitive future in the, in the, in the uh, Indo-Pacific. The first contest is a regional security, a regional security, political security vision, right? There is, a, there is a, there's, there are two contested, contesting visions for Indo-Pacific security right now. One, one sort of, uh, based on the PRC's, you know, increased assertiveness in the region that was described by Roger, and one is the traditional, what I would call status quo U.S. vision for. Pacific security. Those two contests are, that, that, those are two competing visions that are actively being contested right now. That's the first, first contest. The second contest that we actually picked up relatively late in the process of doing our study was there's actually a contest in the United States national security community about exactly how much we want to go all in in the, Asia, in the Indo-Pacific region, right? It's, you can call it an elite counter-elite argument. That's not completely accurate. You can call it, you know, a Euro-focused sort of Russia-focused perspective versus a Indo-Pacific versus focus, but but it's real and it's happening. Because what we found actually is we found in the running out of our study results, we found that there were there were some constituencies that were just saying, why is this actually as important as you're making it? So that those two contests, I think, will will certainly determine U.S. position in the Pacific. The outcome of those two contests. Um, second. Second thing we found is, not surprisingly, you know, when you actually do a study like this, you're going to have to find a problem. Um, and very consistent with the previous two studies, we think that the United States has been using, or is using still probably, a discredited framework for assessing great power competition. Right? It, it, it is a framework that is based on um, the pro post, really largely based on the post-World War II conception of what competition looks like. Right? And as a result of that, using that discredited framework, um, the United States has really delayed an honest and meaningful appraisal of its own vulnerability, right? And so it has been proceeding along sort of the primacy line, again, going back to this idea of post-primacy, it's been proceeding, proceeding along these po these, this primacy line for longer than it should. And as a result of that, it's really delaying a meaningful appraisal of where it sits um, in current competition. So we, came, you know, we didn't come up with this, but we, we found a concept, um, a 1996 business con concept from Richard Devaney um, of Dartmouth. We talked about hyper-competition. We think hyper-competition, the concept of hyper-competition, best captures the contemporary strategic environment within which the United States finds itself tr attempting to secure its interests. And hyper-competition, just to boil it down simply, means you know, uh, the persistent contest for transient advantage. That no advantage is going to be permanent across domains, across contested spaces, that you are going to be in a persistent competition for advantage across you know, the dime at the highest level, across military domains at the, at the operational to theater strategic level, and that you have to either opt in or opt out of that hyper competition and that you're going to be in it for in perpetuity. That it's not going to there is going to be no you know, Valhalla at the end where you, where you achieve some state of ultimate victory, that you are now in, a, in an environment where competition is real, perpetual, um, and persistent. So that's the, that's the third insight. Fourth insight um, is uh, currently the United States is playing a losing hand in the Indo-Pacific area of responsibility. Okay. Um, Cost and risk are all on our shoulders right now. And in order for the United States to actually get back in the competition, we have to find ways to actually flip that equation. Um, again, going back to the idea of hyper-competition, flip the equation in a hyper-competitive way where we're imposing cost and increasing risk on the, 
on the, on the part of our rivals. And then finally, um, really, I mean, if you, if you buy that logic that I just laid out and, and consistent, with the, um, consistent with what we found over the previous two years, it really is as stark as game on or game over. Um, that, there, that the United States has to make a, cho- a choice, um, that it's either in or it's out, that our, the relationships with our allies are reliant on our, how we feel about it and how, we, how, we, how much we push our chips to the center of the table. And I think going forward, we have to look at it that way, that we have to understand that it is as stark a choice as game on or game over. And with that, I'll yield. Well, thank you. Thanks to AEI for this opportunity. And uh, uh, as you can tell from Nate's remarks, uh, my role in his studies was to be Napoleon's corporal. If I could understand it, then it was going to work. And uh, I could be his foil on that. My assignment is to talk about strategy, policy, and senior military perspective. Uh, A real eye roller of a topic here. Most of the time when you get a retired military person up here, a retired government person, you get the technical definitions of strategy and we quickly go into jargon. Uh, let me reduce it <laughs> to its essentials for you. The best, most accurate statement we get of what our strategy is, is our budget. Because that's when you've got to decide where you're going to spend your last dollar. And uh, having spent six years in Washington in my uniform career, much of it in the resource allocation uh, fights, I can tell you that uh, just about everybody in this town is involved in the creation of our budget. Uh, so it's, it's, it's distilled by the time it comes out, but it is really the best statement that we get. That said, this administration's national security strategy that was published in the summary national defense strategy, the 11-page unclassed version of what we're told is a classified version, were actually, in my opinion, great improvements over the previous years. Uh, in the past, also being on the blame line for helping to write some of those, by the time, you, by the time we got it published, they always came out not as a clear statement of what our priorities were, in other words, where we're going to spend money, where we're not going to spend money, but as lists of unobjectionable aspirations. And every, every agency got their bit, and they were not, uh, not really cohesive uh, way to bring the government together to do anything. Uh, these two documents that the administration put out recognize the great power competition is back, They stress the importance of alliances and partnerships with maritime democracies. Great power rivalry is back, and both place a high value, as I said, on allies and partners, just to be redundant for effect here. But in actions, we've had a total retreat on trade. It started with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. This was our invention we got 11 nations out on a limb with us to be able to agree to this, to, to the conditions in what we sold as the gold standard of trade agreements, and then we backed out. Uh, not a way to create a uh, great reputation for standing by our international agreements. Uh, lately, we've, in my opinion, compounded that by putting tariffs on our allies on, on uh, trade, uh, as we all know from the news. What does this do? This allows others to fill the gaps. And we can get into talking about the Belt and Road Initiative, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and other things as we go through the uh, uh, question and answer or the moderated discussion here. The premise of Game On, uh, Nate's excellent study, as he mentioned, is that we are losing in the gray zone, uh, that area between peace and war. We have been not agile, not imaginative, creative, or resourceful, according to the study. As a result, our allies are being Finlandized. They're shaping their policies and strategies to Beijing's desires. Two great examples of this are the Philippines and Thailand, treaty allies of the United States. Even Australia is having an internal debate about the extent of Chinese influence there and how much is uh, proper and how much is profitable. We have proven to be ineffective at answering these gray zone challenges. Uh, We have no intergovernmental consensus on how to do this. Uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, when it was first announced, our reaction was to ask our allies not to join. 
That's kind of stunning. Uh, we're supposed to be the leading capitalist power in the world. We're supposed to be the ones that are best with money, best with investments. And we're trying to put an artificial barrier in here. Most of our allies, by the way, uh, or many of them anyway, did join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, Scarborough Shoal. We had agreement with the Chinese that uh, there'd be a mutual withdrawal, Chinese ships and Philippine ships. The Philippines withdrew. The Chinese didn't. South China Sea, it's, as has been previously mentioned in the uh, undisputed historical sovereignty issue, uh, the permanent court of arbitration, the Philippines brought a case to the permanent court of arbitration. Vietnam signed on as, with a brief in support of that. Uh, the permanent court of arbitration came out on the side of the Philippines, and the response from the United States was silence. And no effective, and we mounted no effective resistance to China's creation of forward operating bases in the Spratly Island archipelago. Uh, this, despite the fact that the dredging of, all, of the coral out of the South China Sea and the creation of the, these artificial projects risked a collapse of the South China Sea ecosystem with attendant problems for uh, supply of protein and food supplies. Uh, the silence in the face of this uh, um, environmental assault was, was telling. In addition, our response, and this is Shangri-La dialogue season, uh, our response to this was uh, Secretary Ashton Carter's statement that we will continue to fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows. I would submit that's essential, but not sufficient. Carrier battle groups transiting, or ships transiting to and from the South China Sea and freedom of navigation operations, et cetera, et cetera, are essential, but they do not do anything for the rights of the Vietnamese, or the ability, rather, of the Vietnamese to access their own waters for fishing and oil exploration, similarly for the Philippines and similarly for Brunei. It uh, simply doesn't help. Our posture, uh, we've got to decide what our goal is. Our goal, I submit, the easiest one to go for is deterrence, uh, meaning that we maintain the peace, and to do that, you need an undoubted ability to prevail. But it depends on a lot of things. There's deterrence by punishment. It's particularly talked about now regarding North Korea. We've had the possibility for a long time to punish North Korea for any use of nuclear weapons. But I submit also what's needed to maintain faith with our allies and faith with others is to create a powerful deterrence by denial. In this day and age, when the, Israelis can de can, when the Israeli Iron Dome system can defeat incoming mortar and artillery rounds, certainly we should be able to defeat inbound cruise missiles and ballistic missiles, not just aimed at the United States, but aimed at our allies. And we have been pretty silent on the effect of the North Korean issue on our allies lately. We talk a lot about our, the effect on us but we haven't talked about our allies. Technology changes. Uh, there's a number of things uh, d d that are happening and without getting into a complete um, morass of discussions of hypotheticals with cyber and space and all these things, let me just posit two things that have changed in plain sight over the last 20 years and you can decide whether re we're reacting well to this or not. One is surveillance. Uh, when I was 20 years ago, a lot of the images that you can get on your iPhone while you're uh, looking at it in your lap while I'm talking uh, were classified not too many years ago. Now you can get Google Earth pictures of just about anything you want, plus other more exotic surveillance platforms. Couple that with weapons accurate at distance, and the old habits that most of us grew up in in the military that are on sort of the uh, back nine of life now, uh, involved mass, large forces, maneuvering, and things like that. Let me posit that in days of ubiquitous, pervasive surveillance with weapons accurate at distance, mass takes on a whole new aspect, and it becomes a critical vulnerability. We've got to do something that Secretary Gates, we've got to consider doing something that Secretary Gates talked about during his tenure as Secretary of Defense, and develop the ability to have a widely distributed, politically sustainable, operationally resistant posture. 
You hear a little bit of echoes of this in what General Milley with the U.S. Army Chief, the Army, U.S. Army Chief of Staff is calling multi-domain battle. Translation, the ground forces cannot be content just to stand on the beach with fixed bayonets and let the Navy and the Air Force duke it out for control of the sea and the airspace. The Army's got to be able to participate with weapons also accurate at distance in the fight for air and sea superiority. Uh, and we need to be able to do this from a widely distributed posture, simplest translation, it won't be colonels, captains, generals, and admirals in charge of big massive formations and bases anymore because they're vulnerable. It'll be like captains with 120 people controlling weapons that are maneuverable, can get out of the way of inbound attacks, but they can also help sustain air and sea supremacy. And our allies are maritime democracies. Air and sea supremacy is the key to deterrence and the key to safety and the key to many other things. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm uh, batting clean up, I guess. So I'll take three mighty whiffs and see if I can get something out of the ballpark or at least strike out quickly. Um, it's been interesting to, to listen to the presentations. What I'm struck by is how much they uh, mark the way in which uh, the American conversation about China's rise has really changed over the last generation or so. Um, I'm going to tell an old man story here. So back when I worked in the House Armed Services Committee, the committee uh, proposed that the DOD undertake an annual study of Chinese military power uh, every year, uh, which was immediately um, identified as veto bait uh, on the part of the White House. Uh, but, uh, you know, 25 year years or 25 editions of that study later, um, it has become a commonplace uh, that, that uh, uh, China is a, a rising great power, you know, it's hard to sort of define with precision what that exactly means. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, China's um, economic growth, uh, the increase in its military power, um, the um, sort of ideological competition that it's uh, uh, beginning to undertake. But I, I still think that overall the strategic conversation lacks a couple of things that are uh, probably need to be tossed into the mix uh, before we're really able to uh, intelligently or successfully um, undertake this competition. Uh, uh, if the game is on, we still kind of lack a game plan to a certain degree. So I'm going to suggest that there are, there are two things that, that need to be uh, uh, tossed into this uh, hopper. The first of all, uh, the first element is that it would be good to have a good historical analogy that would help us think through the nature of the Chinese challenge. Um, uh, just reading the literature over the last generation or so, um, there's not a whole lot of a, have not been many attempts to do that, but those who have attempted to do it have likened Chinese, uh, China's rise to the rise of Wilhelmine Germany uh, in the late 19th century uh, and early 20th century, uh, which I think is uh, only uh, uh, an analogy of limited value. The one that I would like to toss out there and, uh, and, and talk about a bit is to talk a bit more about the rise of uh, Bourbon France uh, beginning in the 1660s and continuing through really uh, to the Battle of Waterloo. Um, and the thing that makes the difference is that France was both a continental power and a maritime power. So if we think about China simply as an East Asian maritime uh, challenge uh, to the United States and its allies, we're missing a lot of, um, we're certainly not seeing things the way that the Chinese uh, see things. And to go back to, to Nate's, one of Nate's uh, five points, we're, we're missing, missing uh, an opportunity to impose costs on the Chinese uh, that we're certainly not doing a whole heck of a lot to do um, uh, under the current uh, moment. And if you were looking at the rise of France, particularly from a British point of view, you would say that uh, France is most dangerous when it has peace on the continent and can build up its maritime and other forms of power projection 
uh, military capacities in order to contest the Royal Navy, not only in the Channel or on the Atlantic, uh, but in the Caribbean and really globally, which brings me to a second uh, aspect of that competition, and I think of the U.S.-China competition that, that doesn't get enough emphasis, and that is it is a global competition. The scoreboard, so to speak, or the principal um, uh, uh, theater may be that East Asian, uh, East Asian maritime theater, but uh, as the Chinese are demonstrating from their own behavior, they understand that, at least in a globalized world, um, that it's impossible to be a regional power without also being a global power. So that the, the outcomes that the Chinese are seeking in East Asia inevitably for them uh, lead them outward uh, from the narrow seas uh, around, uh, along the Western Pacific littoral, um, lead them farther inland uh, across the Asian continent, ergo the sort of uh, One Belt, One Road initiative, lead them into the Indian Ocean uh, and to the Persian Gulf. And now we find also that they're, uh, you know, casting, uh, putting chum in the water even in Europe to try to uh, exploit fissures between uh, the Trump administration and uh, uh, the European Union and other uh, sovereign nations in Europe. So we also need to see this uh, as a global competition. Final, final sort of element to this history lesson. Uh, the British were most successful when they engaged both uh, in, the, um, in the maritime competition <laughs> but also in the continental competition, principally through allies. Uh, Britain never had the capacity to deploy massive land forces on the continent, but it was necessary uh, uh, in order to um, contain France, if you will, uh, to strike up alliances and to offer subsidies <laughs> to a variety of German princes and other um, uh, uh, even as, as uh, far afield as uh, Eastern Germany, um, and always to try to be open to prying away f French clients and to combating French um, diplomatic subsidies at court, even uh, in the Middle East. Uh, you know, uh, part part of the strategy for uh, preserving a favorable balance of power in, in Europe involved. Uh, uh, you know, uh, appeals and uh, bribes uh, to the uh, Ottoman court uh, at the same time. So, uh, again, I just think we need a way to think about this competition that goes beyond uh, just sort of political science mm -hmm. uh, kinds of structures and analogies uh, and, and offers some models that could not be sort of impo you know, imported um, uh, entire in their entirety, but again, offer a way to think about these kinds of competitions and offer a model for success. Lastly, I think we need to do some introspection about what our own, what the baggage is that we bring to the table. Um, it, it, we are not a status quo power, certainly if you uh, regard the role of America in the world more broadly than rather than just sort of in the post-Cold War uh, setting. And it's certainly the case uh, in East Asia. The East Asia that is today so prosperous, uh, um, so um, uh, dynamic, uh, is also politically dynamic. And part of the reason is that we have found a way to inculcate many of our political values among Confucian and other kinds of East Asian cultures in a way that um, many people never expected that we could, uh, and some people today don't even accept as being the case, including many significant East Asian uh, leaders. Uh, but I th again, I think that to look at it um, objectively, uh, you have to say that Japan and South Korea and Taiwan, our principal uh, treaty allies and strategic partners, are today very different societies than they were before we started engaging with them on a 
day in, day out basis. That makes success for us. Um, again, not simply the retention of the status quo, but the um, flourishing uh, of an international political system that has certain characteristics, in particular, uh, the recognition of individual liberties and property rights and all the things that are enshrined in our founding documents. So in engaging in a competition with China, it's a good idea to sort of stare yourself in the mirror and uh, take the measure of your own, you know, be very clear about what your own strategic goals are and do your best to try to uh, get the tools that you're going to use and the strategies that you're going to employ uh, to be heading in the direction that you want to go. And we have not done that either. So in this process of coming to grips uh, with the rise of China and the growth of Chinese military power, we have well begun or we've gotten past the first stage of uh, better assessing uh, the nature of the challenge, particularly militarily, but also increasingly uh, politically and economically. And uh, uh, we probably still have some work to do in terms of the uh, ideological competition, which has always been a strength of the United States. But beyond that, we need to move beyond that. We need to start, think, start thinking now about what precisely to do about it, what kind of strategies are congenial for us, meaning we can sustain them over decades and decades, because again, if we take the France analogy, we're talking about 1660 to 1815, so it was not something that was a rapid, decisive operation or anything like that. Um, so we need to be able, to, and uh, in order for us to sustain it, it has to be a strategy that we believe in. But it also has to be, uh, I think, something that, that takes as large an aperture, uh, opens our um, geopolitical aperture as, as widely as, as, we can, uh, um, as we can tolerate uh, and, and think that, again, this competition is actually, in some sense, a global competition, even if the, the principal um, uh, area of contestation uh, is the Western Pacific. So by that, I'm out of, out of steam. Thank you, Tom. Really interesting remarks from all of our panelists. Um, and uh, I particularly liked how you made the point, Tom, about um, the need to be um, introspective and look at ourselves. Um, you're channeling Sunza there, of course, knowing ourselves as well as we know the enemy to be able to oh, succeed sure, in didn't battle. Do that. <laughs> so whether that was intentional or not, I'm not sure, but well done. Um, so just to take the moderator's prerogative, I'm going to ask each of you a question, and then uh, given time, I think after that point, we'll just open it up to the audience. Um, uh, Tom, I also wanted to pick up on your point about the global nature of this competition. Um, and my first question to Roger. Um, you talked about the rejuvenation of, of China and how that is kind of what they're pursuing and um, you know, trying to uh, regain the position that they had historically, not only regionally, but also throughout the globe. So if you could talk a little bit about maybe the limits of that reju rejuvenation, like what they would need to accomplish to feel like they are, um, they've, they've regained their historical, their historical power, their historical presence. I mean, we could go, of course, and look back at Zhang has voyages, we could look at a lot of different things, but um, what do you think they're going to need to feel like they're back on top? Yeah, so uh, I think I would go back to the uh, four things I touched on earlier. One would be uh, uh, China's overall national prosperity. Now, uh, even though I said earlier that China's economy is by some measures larger than that of the US today, um, but China also has four times the population of the United States. So they're, they're not nearly as wealthy as the United States on a per person basis. And, um, and that's not likely to happen, certainly not this century. So, um, so, but I think from the point of view of the Chinese leadership, China is not there yet in terms of its economic development, that it would want to at least reach the levels of development of countries like Taiwan or South Korea, um, uh, who have in some ways been its models for its, its development process. Mm -hmm. That would be number one. Uh, number two, 
Um, and, and Xi Jinping made this quite clear at mm -hmm. the uh, 19th Party Congress last fall, would be to have a world-class military. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, he has set the goal of achieving that by 2035 now. Um, number three uh, would be political influence, and uh, both in the region and in world affairs. Now, China, as a member of the UN Security Council, and so on, already is, you know, one of the one of the five most important countries in the world politically. But I think they would want to get to the point where it's clear that they're one of the probably two most important countries in the world politically. If they're not there yet, um, then, then that would be a goal. Um, and then, um, and this is one that I think gets overlooked, but in traditionally in Chinese history, China wasn't just a military power. In fact, that wasn't really what made Chinese uh, civilization so glorious. It was the Chinese culture. And uh, within China, they're very aware of this, that they are consumers of, of other people's cultures, reproducers of it in some cases, but uh, mm -hmm. not a lot, you know, and, you know, we like to see anime in the U.S. We, we play Japanese designed video games. Um, so clearly Japan is an example of a country that exerts cultural influence outside of just Asia. And I think for the Chinese leadership, the goal would be for China to surpass Japan in that regard as well. So those would be the, the sort of the four criteria by which a Chinese leader, oh, and I'm, I'm forgetting a very important one, which I will get to in just a sec. Um, those would be the four criteria by which um, a Chinese leader could say, see, we are now back to where we belong if they satisfy those four criteria. But there's actually a fifth one that I mentioned in my remarks, and that is the complete recovery of all lost national territories. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at you, Taiwan. Um, and I don't, I think as long as, and you know, multiple Chinese leaders over the years have said this, as long as Taiwan remains politically separate from the mainland, the mission of restoring China um, to its rightful place in the world will remain incomplete. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Nate, just to shift gears a little bit um, to North Korea, because we haven't really addressed that quite as much. Um, so many people view the um, PACOM, Indo-PACOM, whatever we're calling it now, um, as fundamentally a sea and maybe an air type of theater. Um, and uh, I think that your study really transcends just a ground forces perspective, and I think it's applicable to the joint force writ large. Um, but I'm just kind of curious if you can talk a little bit about the role that the presence of ground troops plays in deterrence and, and in hyper-competition. Um, and I mentioned North Korea because I think that's maybe the most uh, germane to current news, but I think it, you can widen the scope out more generally, too, if you'd like. So uh, we've talked a lot about Korea. Mm -hmm. um, the, there's the way I the way I look at it. I'm I'm by no means a Korea expert, but you know, looking at it as a you know a, a defense generalist and looking, having spent at least the last three years looking at the region, there's there's the the three outcomes in Korea, right? That you can kind of foresee right now, um, or at least the three directions, general strategic directions. You can see, just the, to get the easy one out of the way, sort of a status quo. You know, the maintenance of the status quo. There's a not the status quo as of immediately today, but I mean the general one we've been used to over time, which is a uh, you know, relatively tense situation between the two Koreas and um, a significant U.S. military presence that's there specifically to, um, to support our treaty alliance with the Republic of Korea and maintain that. So that's sort of the easy one that you can say that let's use that as kind of the baseline. Then there is... Um, you know, the, the, the next is some kind of significantly reduced tensions between the two Koreas, where the relationship is um, much better, um, there's more cross-border flows, the, you know, perhaps there's some liberalization in North Korea that, that, that allows for a, you know, their own version of Glasnost, I guess, or something that allows for a better relationship with, with the South. And as a result of that, it's sort of a reduced level of tension between the two. So that's a, a possible sort of strategic direction. And then the third is, you know, reunification of some description. Collapse of the North or an agreed upon political framework 
that as an evolutionary reunification of the two careers, whatever it is, um, you know, I guess I'm forgetting a fourth, and a fourth would be war, right? <laughs> um, but, but, but I think that the more likely, the, the three likeliest sort of um, paths right now are those three general paths, and I think I can include war in number one, that it could degenerate into a, you know, an escalation that gets out of control and becomes war. Um, but having said all of that, uh, though, that speaks to three different roles for the United States. Uh, and that's what we've kind of come across in our work, right? So hostility, you know, cross-border hostility and the potential for war speaks to a very robust U.S. military focus on the Korean Peninsula that remains, you know, tied closely to our Korean partners and, you know, continued military exercises and military operations intended to shape the decision-making of the North Korean regime and in the event of a conflict, you know, fall in on the Korean Peninsula and actually, um, you know, achieve our military objectives there. Um, you know, a situation where any of the other two creates a very different dynamic for U.S. military presence in, on the Korean Peninsula, right? Um, and I think that this is one of the biggest issues that's, I think this is one of the biggest question marks, and I would actually want Tom, we talked about this when we were here before, and, and Chip, I'd like to hear your thoughts on this too, but I think that, that is one of the biggest issues in the region right now because you can see it in the current discussion about um, the current you know, discussions about denuclearization and things like that. You can see U.S. military presidents becoming a bargaining chip potentially. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, in the event that there is some kind of rapprochement between the two, you can see U.S. military presence being viewed by uh, the South is not being necessary and potentially um, inflammatory to the Chinese to a certain extent. And as a result of that, uh, um, a, a, another bargaining chip. Um, but I want to make, the, the point I want to make, and I don't know if this answers your question specifically, but the point I think that I want to make that we've come across in, in the work that we've done over the last year is that um, Korea is bigger than Korea. That's the word we've been That's the term we've been using. Like, U.S. relationship with South Korea is bigger than just the North and South Korean dynamic. And if we, not, only, not only do we have to start viewing it that way and begin underwriting our relationship with South Korea in a way that makes them believe that we, that we really, truly do believe that, um, but, but we, also, uh, we, we, all, we also have to encourage South Korea to believe that as well, right? I, and... I'm not, you know, I, there are ways to do that. And the people that know Asia probably better than me will know how we can do that. But I think it includes, you know, hoping, you know, in any way we can have the South Koreans realize a much broader role uh, for themselves, see themselves in a much broader context than in just the, than in just the Korean peninsula, peninsula security dynamic. I think failing that, we have, we are in grave danger of, um, an eroding relationship or a, a fraying of the relationship between ourselves and South Korea. And the way I like to, in military terms, the way I like to put it is, I mean, in pure, pure military terms, Korea is part of the first island chain, right? Um, so if you want to look at it in pure military competitive terms, that is, a, that, that is, that is the, way you want to, you want, the way you want to look at it. But in much broader context, I think it will be important for the United States from a confidence-building perspective from the perspective of actually not only just in Asia, but worldwide, us demonstrating that we're willing to stay and continue to support the, uh, you know, the, our partners in the Korean Peninsula and do whatever it takes to do that and, and encourage them to take a larger role. Thank you. Um, so kind of on this theme of the um, overall larger picture, what's the bigger goal? Um, Chip, you brought up several examples of the um, alternative economic order that China's trying to establish uh, through the One Belt, One Road Initiative, the Asian um, uh, Infrastructure Development Bank, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, if any, role do you think the military can play in countering some of these developments? Um, and uh, how should these efforts be coordinated with other parts of the government, and who should be coordinating them? Well, the military's role in uh the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank or the Belt and Road Initiative is uh, really nil. And uh, this raises the point that with the rebalance, we may be doing a lot of things on the military side. For example, the four largest 
base construction projects since World War II are now going on in Asia as at this time. And they're all paid for by somebody else. Camp Humphreys in Korea is paid for by the Republic of Korea. The continued expansion of Marine Corps Air Station Iwakuni, and it's got far more than Marines there now. It's got Carrier Air Wing 5, and it's got a large Japanese aviation uh, uh, component is being paid for by the Japanese. The relocation of Marine Corps Air Station Futenma is being paid for by the Japanese, and a large portion, about 49% of their original costs for the base buildup in Guam is being paid for by the Japanese. And all this is wonderful, and military's presence and military actions in the region are all essential, but they're not sufficient. And this is why backing off of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, in my opinion, was uh, such a damaging blow. And this is not a partisan comment. Uh, both administrations failed, in my opinion. Uh, the previous administration did not get the TPP to the Senate when they had uh, a good chance of having the capital to, to be able to pass it. And of course, we know what happened in the current administration. The second set of American founding fathers, if you will, uh, those elder statesmen, uh, here between 1945 and 1950, and maybe 1955 if you stretch it a bit, uh, set out to reestablish a global order that would prevent yet another great power conflict like the first half of the 20th century was afflicted with. And there's a raft of initials and acronyms and everything we can talk about, but whatever the, whatever the deficiencies of the system is that they created, it worked. We got through the Cold War without yet another great power conflict. We might want to be careful about throwing that out and adopting a different model. And if the United States is not going to be the champion for the, quote, liberal international order, then it's not going to survive. Thank you. Um, uh, on that note, Tom, I mean, you brought up Fran uh, Burman France as a really interesting uh, historical precedent that we should kind of look at. Um, it brings up a point that others have brought up about the Cold War being kind of a model that we can look at, uh, the competition with the Soviet Union. Um, what do you think about that? I mean, do you think that that makes sense? Do you maybe see some limitations to that model? To the Cold War model? Right, in, yeah. in trying to think about our competition with, to the competition with China. Um, well, obviously, the sort of locus of competition is in a very different part of the world, um, and uh, apropos of the uh, uh, post-World War II order, I mean, we took different approaches to Europe and to East Asia. The mm -hmm. traditional hub-and-spoke mm -hmm. system of alliances has served incredibly well. However, um, you know, we did uh, knock out some of our own spokes, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, in a way that we now... Uh, are reaping the, I wouldn't say benefits of, but the consequences of. Um, so, uh, uh, again, I, I, I think we took kind of a, uh, you know, um, w imp one thing that we certainly could learn from that early co uh, post-World uh, War II era is that a um, more collective approach to international politics and to security is is likely to be a more robust, uh, you, you know, uh, again, I think we're, uh, there have been consequences for, from us being the, uh, uh, the, uh, the hub, so to speak, in that the spokes have, you know, the tensions between Korea and Japan are possibly overblown uh, um, in, in the popular mind, but, you know, that, the kinds of things that we have done to bring European nations closer together. Um, the EU, for all its faults, is a, a more robust institution than any, um, you know, analogous organization in, uh, in Asia. And then finally, I would say, look, I mean, I, I think it's very telling and probably a good idea to Although we'll, you know, those guys will spend a lot of time on airplanes in Indo PACOM, mm -hmm. but those two regions are uh, very closely linked. Um, uh, you know, thinking about that space as a whole continuum, which again sort of makes the fulcrum move from north to south. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, that, as that takes root, uh, I think that could be a, you know, certainly an opportunity for more inventive strategic thinking. In the Pacific, I mean, th those two theaters were, you know, vitally intertwined uh, in the course of the Pacific War and World War II. So um, uh, I think there are things that properly considered we could, we could sort of import or refashion from our, uh, you know, past uh, or post-World War II experience uh, that, that could be a useful uh, uh, going forward from here, for sure. Yeah, I think you're contrasting of the hub and spoke system with uh, you know the different architecture in Europe. You know, and EU is really interesting. And as anybody who's um, tried to facilitate or encourage um, some of our allies in the eastern or in east in the eastern Pacific to work together, it can certainly be a challenge and one that I think impedes maybe um, a larger strategic approach that we can leverage against some of our ad common adversaries. Can I make a quick Absolutely, comment please. on the post Cold War thing too? Um, so, in something we found. A couple years ago when we looked, I mean, the real, one of the real differences I see, too, is um, we, we campaigned all the way from basically at least 1950 to 1989, 91, whenever, whatever you want to call the end of it. We literally campaigned, you know, not necessarily, you know, we, we, we purposefully campaigned in that against rivals in that, in that period and, and across the dime. Mm. Using all the instruments of national power, you know, using every buzzword I can use right now. <laughs> but I mean, we we campaigned against the Soviets, you know, and and operated against the Soviets. Um, and I I think that um, you know the one thing, the one real difference is this this you know whatever you want to call that thing that occurred after 1991, the unipolar moment, the end of history, whatever whatever it was. I mean, we really took that to heart. And dangerously so, I mean, and became Spend a great vacation, <laughs> right? And became complacent about the nature of competition, and became complacent about. And it doesn't. I'm not actually advocating a, an aggressive, you know, um, necessarily in a you know higher level of aggression on the part of the United States. What I'm just saying is that just sort of our, you know staying you know on our you know staying on our feet in a good two point athletic stance was uh, was something we lost over over the period of the post-Cold War period. Great. Uh, uh, any other comments from our panels before we open the questions? Good. Yeah, uh, one of the differences with the Soviet Union was the Soviets had an autarkic economy. Mm -hmm. uh, they made it easy for us. Uh, we don't have that situation anymore, and it requires a lot more deep thinking. Secondly, on the questions that the moderators uh, tried to tease out a lot, the intersection between the military and the other elements of national power, our alliances have to be far more than just the ability of the two militaries from each yes. nation to operate together. And we can do some work on that, too. But it's got to be far more than that. It's got to be the integration of all aspects of national life, uh, from uh, business and commerce and education and all these other things, uh, because that's the value proposition of the system that mm -hmm. uh, we brought into existence, yes. and we have to be very careful about how we handle it. Third, on the Korea point, and, and Europe, the original line drawn by George Kennan and Acheson and the rest right. of them intentionally left Korea out. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Japan and the first island chain were where we were going to uh, in, invest our efforts and our interest. That changed in June 1950, and it changed because of actions going on in Europe, and President Truman felt that to let the invasion of South Korea go unanswered would set a very bad precedent for Europe. Yep. Uh, I agree, Korea is a maritime country. It's, got, it's a peninsula, so by definition, it's three sides surrounded by uh, three sides touching the water. But uh, uh, the, the connection was there in the Cold War yep. and d made forcefully by the, grandson, the grandfather, Kim, in 1950 for us. Absolutely. Um, okay, so we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, let's go ahead and open to some questions. It seems like a lot of people are very interested. Uh, we'll just start right here in the front. And if you could just wait for a microphone and so everybody can hear you. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Mitsuo Nakai, uh, Reagan Foundation. 
my number one concern is North Korea, obviously, uh, Chip. Uh, but uh, you touched the base uh, a little bit about the South, Cor uh, South China Sea issues we have. Can you expand that just a little bit? Because um, that's, that's going to be a, a big problem in the future. It could be. Uh, you want me to expand on the North Korea bit or South China Sea? Uh, both. Both. Okay. <laughs> um, and while you're at it. Yeah. Um, well, whatever comes out of June 12th, uh, our, the, our, our allied political leaders, South Korea and Japan in particular, are going to need something that they can say to their own constituents about how they're better off now. And uh, this, gets, uh, this gets to the proper type of deterrence. Uh, I mentioned in my uh, earlier remarks about deterrence by denial. Uh, for those technically minded in the room, we've been working for quite some time now talking about boost phase intercept, which means destroying North Korean missiles as they're launched over North Korea instead of over Japan or over the Sea of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's time to move out on this. Uh, the, there's a danger out of these negotiations of a separate peace if we settle for something like uh, destruction of North Korean intercontinental ballistic missiles. That does not help Japan. Matter of fact, it could hurt these types of things. It's, there's, there's a raft of things coming out of this that we have to manage very, very carefully. Is it a bad idea to have a summit? That presupposes that our previous more formal policy and strategy execution with North Korea has been effective. It has not. Uh, we first, the first, the North Korean threat first became publicly known, or rather the American public first became aware of it around 1991. Uh, Secretary uh, Perry uh, said, quote, we were looking into the abyss, and he later wrote a book about it. Uh, we got to an agreement, uh, we got to the, matter of fact, the agreed framework agreement, the North Koreans cheated on the agreement, and we started into this cycle where North Korea acts out, we, we initially consider preemptive attack, just like we did in 1993. Uh, we decide that that's a bad idea, so then we go to talks, talks lead to agreements, North Korea cheats on the agreements, and rinse, repeat, and, and we go through this with every administration, and we're into that again. Uh, so what will come out of this? Don't know. But this has got to be very, very carefully managed, and this is a challenge for our alliance managers. On the South China Sea, South Ch China has de facto control over the South China Sea now. Every American vessel that sails through there is shadowed by a Chinese vessel. The image that's portrayed to the Chinese is we're there only at their deference. Uh, the, uh, we don't ha yet to my knowledge, have any effective agreements to uh, carve out space for the Philippines to, for the people of the Philippines to access their traditional fishing areas. Same with Vietnam, same with Brunei, same with the other nations that, uh, uh, whose shores are washed by the South China Sea. The demands have increased. There's a new line that expands what the Nine Dash line claimed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is not a problem that's going to be solved. It's got to be a matter to be managed because Xi Jinping is now a dictator for life and he has adopted personally this mantra of undisputed historical sovereignty. That means that he cannot compromise on this. And so we, we need to find a better way to manage this. On the, uh, the greater topic that comes out of this of countering gray zone challenges, uh, same thing like with the Russian little green men in Ukraine, after they annex Crimea and all these things. Pushing back symmetrically on this has got a lot of uh, disadvantages. Pushing back asymmetrically has got some possibilities. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to find ways to start doing this. We need to be able to stand up, in my opinion, for the principles that uh, we established um, coming out of World War II that uh, generally kept the peace between the great powers despite a bunch of uh, proxy wars uh, below the level of great power conflict. Um, either we believe in this or we don't. Uh, 
but right now we're not effectively answering these coercive challenges and that puts our friends and allies and the maritime democracies on the spot and they've got to adjust and we don't want to put them in that position. Can I add one little yeah. quick yeah. point? Please. Um, so the, the one thing I was going to say too, that, that, that I just think that we, this is a very nerdy defense point. Fine. But um, <laughs> I, we expect nothing less. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> But I just feel like we, you know, we became enamored, sort of early 2000s, we became enamored with technical solutions to a lot of things, and we are, which are important. And we are being out, we are being out teched all of, in, certain, in certain respects now by, by rivals. Um, and what we lost in a lot of ways is we lost the idea that geography still really matters a lot. And it gets to this point, and that's why I didn't say it strongly enough when I talked about, about Korea, but Korea is essential. A relationship with Korea is essential to the whole, to the, to the it not, not just, the, you know, sort of on a personal level between the two nations. But I'm just saying from, the, from a chessboard perspective, the Korean peninsula is essential. And so too is the Philippines. And, it, it, and I just want to sort of talk about the Philippines and just say we really have to do something, you know, quickly and, and assertively to reestablish a relationship with the Philippines that can get... Um, that can get back on a healthy, a healthy footing. Oddly enough, we have a higher approval rating among Filipinos that are polled in the Philippines than we have approval rating in the United States of people that are that are polled. Uh, the um, it's 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 an odd problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Phil, can, <laughs> if I could get a thirty second uh, uh, footnote, I wanted to underscore something that General Gregson said earlier, which. I thought it was critical, but we didn't talk about that much. And that is, in the South China Sea, the measure of effectiveness is what other people can do. It's the fishing rights of yep. the locals. It's the transit rights of, uh, uh, you know, other uh, ships from other nations, particularly uh, Japan, uh, for example. Um, and also apropos of uh, Nate's point, we've become so... I mean, the thing that I wonder about coming out of the defense review in particular is this obsession with lethality. It matters not that we could still sink every Chinese boat in the water uh, uh, in the South China Sea. That is just like the wrong measure of effectiveness, at least in this case. Um, and the fact that we are not there, that we you yep, know, right. read about the boat bumping incidents on or see them on TV or, you know, through Google Earth or whatever. It's just, it seems like we're he headed down the wrong road, which in some ways is going to make it worse rather than better. It's not what we ought to be doing. Um, over here, yes. A question for Mr. Donnelly. Um, just because we did discuss how President Xi Jinping is now dictator if for life. If you could also just uh, introduce yourself oh. and say where you're from. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry. Forgot to mention that. Alec Bickerstaff, DC. Um, can you transfer that model of bourbon France to the presidency itself? And, and if yes, is President Jinping, is he more Louis XIV or is he more like <laughs> Napoleon? Uh, nice. <laughs> Well, from our British perspective, it was really hard to tell the difference between the, the Louis. You know, some Louis were more efficient than others. Um, but look, I, I do think the fact that uh, it's not, first of all, it's not like the Chinese government was a model of, uh, you know, democracy and representation uh, to begin with, but um, uh, it does the fact that he is, you know, going to be there has clearly solidified his um, uh, hold on power in Beijing, and I think most importantly, the the kinds of things that again I think Chip mentioned is that the way he's done it is by reasserting this very muscular, robust nationalism, and he's put a whole host of markers on the wall that, um, you know, at least for the time being seem to have a, a you know, a help to bring people, Chinese people together to rally them around that. But if he fails, um, it, it's be hard for him to fail. It'd be, you know, really undercut his power uh, if he fails to achieve these or fails to make 
progress on him, and that's a very, you know, it's a high wire act for him and dangerous for us. So he's more like Louis the Fourteenth than he is, uh, you know. Uh -oh. <laughs> Um, okay, we, right here? But his wig isn't as nice. <laughs> <laughs> and by, by from, I mean like which organization you're representing, though. <laughs> uh, Leah from Voice of America's Mandarin Service. Uh, we know China was recently disinvited from the RIMPAC 2018, and Vietnam and some other countries are inviting him for the first time. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, do you think this is, all the panelists, um, do you think this is an effective response um, to China's um, uh, actions in South China Sea? Uh, what do you think will come next? Because the Pentagon made it clear that this is just the initial response, right, mm -hmm. to the mil militarization of uh, South China Sea by China. So what are likely to come next? you want to take that first, Ryan? Sure. I'll... I'll venture a couple of comments. Um, first of all, the, the Chinese have been quick to say, oh, no big deal. We didn't really want to go anyways, and, <laughs> and that sort of stuff. Um, uh, I mean, clearly, disinviting them from RIMPAC is, is not an effective way of countering what China has been doing on the islands it claims in the South China Sea. Um, so I, I, nonetheless, I think it was an important signal to send that mm -hmm. uh, for the U.S. to say, hey, you can't be messing with us over here, and then uh, meanwhile, uh, we're still going to try to do business with you as, as usual. And so I, I think it was definitely the right thing for the U.S. Defense Department to do. Um, but hopefully there will be other responses. Now, uh, I agree with General Gregson that you know, we can't really, since we aren't in the region, we don't have, uh, China now has the world's largest Coast Guard um, in terms of number of ships anyways. Uh, we can't really compete with China in terms of patrolling the South China Sea. Uh, we simply don't have, and none of the other countries in the region have the assets needed for that. So our response to what China has been doing in that region has to be asymmetric. Um, uh, that said, uh, coming up with appropriate sorts of things is, is a challenge and, and a problem that hopefully people are working on, um, but would require some study. There's been talk of economic sanctions and so on. I think, uh, frankly, I think um, what we did with regard to China's cyber intrusions a, a couple of years ago is a good model for this, where China is you know, has been very aggressively using state-sponsored hackers to try to steal U.S. commercial secrets. Well, um, a symmetrical response didn't, wouldn't make sense because, first of all, what they were doing was really illegal um, and, and went beyond just sort of regular spy versus spy stuff. And also, they just don't have that many secrets for us to steal. So uh, what we said was, um, you know, we'll just be stealing our own secrets back. Um, uh, so what we said was, no, we're going to impose economic sanctions on you. Um, now, I, I'm not saying economic sanctions are the right response in the case of the South China Sea, but, um, but I just think that's an example of where if we get creative and and think beyond just the Defense Department, what the Defense Department should do in response to what China's military is doing, uh, that's where the appropriate responses can be found. Ha having said that, I would, I would say also that, and this is, a, again, a carryover observation from previous work, but it, it's going to be reflected in the current work we're doing now, too. Just having a concept of operations and mm -hmm. operating against, we're right now the way we... You know, we do things now as if the, the, there is no competition, mm -hmm. right? And we have to sort of redefine, you know, in a defense sense, we actually have to redefine what it is to operate in this space and to create effects in this space. Um, a, a, just a quick throwaway line. One thing I think that's really, that we stumbled on that's really interesting is what does presence mean in cyber? I mean, that, I, I, I mean, that's a, the, so right, like we talk about presence on land, 
We talk about presence in the sea, right? We kind of have an idea of the architecture in space. What does it mean in what does it mean in cyber? What does it mean to demonstrate presence? I think that that's one of those areas. It's an area for and EMS, by the way, cyber and the electromagnetic spectrum. How do you establish presence and demonstrate sort of effective presence in those in those areas? Uh, real quickly, uh, I, I agree. The uh, uh, withdrawing the invitation to RIMPAC is a signal. It's a gesture. It's a beginning. Uh, there are many other things that we have to work on. One is countering not just the Coast Guard, but the maritime militia and the armed fishermen uh, that, that the Chinese deploy. Um, again, symmetric responses are, are, are difficult. We have to find other ways. Uh, Japan experiences aerial intrusions at a rate not seen since the Cold War. Uh, this is a cost-imposing measure on Japan because they have to launch airplanes to... Uh, to, uh, to, to, to meet this. Uh, anecdotally, uh, Naha Airport and Naha Air Base are the same place. It's one runway at present and one taxiway. There's a landfill, going, landfill program going on in Okinawa that does not get any complaints, and that's the expansion of Naha <laughs> to two runways. But the Japanese have had to double the amount of F-15s present at Naha Air Base from two squadrons to four and they are very, very busy. You rarely get in and out of there on a commercial aircraft without being delayed by F-15 scrambles. This, this costs money out of the Japanese defense budget to be able to answer this. This is a cost-imposing measure. We have to figure out a way to impose costs in return, asymmetrically, some other way perhaps. Uh, third and last, and a little more uh, uh, theoretical, uh, in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik. Those of us who were sentient at the time and in grade school or middle school were suddenly told that we were going to become engineers right. because we had to catch up with the Soviets. And uh, uh, so all of us slugged through trigonometry and, you know, all these other things. Uh, the, uh, uh, the period between 1945 and 1950, we were Lord of Always Surveyed in both parts of the world in 1945. There's nobody left to fight. You know, peace has returned forever. And then the Soviets blockaded Berlin. The, uh, the Soviets exploded their own atomic weapon. Mao Zedong defeated Chiang Kai-shek, and then in 1950, Kim Il-sung in invaded. Everything changed. Suddenly, we had, to, we, we had to rebuild the armed forces, go back, but we found our voice. We competed ideologically with the Soviet Union. Yeah, they made it easy, autarkic economy and everything. But you go back and look at the rhetoric of our political leaders during the early part of the Cold War. We talked about principles. We talked about human rights. We talked about who we are. We talked about being, in Reagan's phrase that he borrowed from Winthrop, uh, the city on the hill. Uh, we don't do that anymore. We drew back from talking about human rights because we had more important issues to work with various countries. This is like sitting in a poker game and not playing our ace. Human rights is who we are. And that's not just an Obama statement. You can go back to Reagan's 1983, I think, Human Rights Day speech for some of the finest rhetoric you can find on this. We need to start talking about not just who we are, I mean, not just, just what we want, but, but who we are. And we need to start being able to talk again so we can appeal to captive populations that otherwise would not hear our message. Uh, earlier, uh, the question was asked about North Korea. We've proven we have very, very few tools to affect North Korea behavior. It's a land of lousy options, as Victor Cha once said. But one of, the way, one of the things we can do is start talking more about human rights. The North Korean people, the ones that are held hostage by their own government, are getting more and more information now from the outside world, thanks to USB sticks and everything else. Well, okay, the United States needs to be part of the message that they're getting. And I despair that we're not doing that. We're, we're into technical discussions and geek speak uh, on defense technology and everything and uh, uh, confusing stuff about uh, tariff agreements, trade, da, da 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 all these things. We're not talking about why we do all this, and we need to get back to that.
absolutely agree. Uh, Tom, did you have any no, final no, thoughts? Because okay. we're running a little bit over. No. So um, if the panelists can, if they have some free time, please stay for a few minutes afterwards, because we have a lot of questions that I don't think we're going to have time to answer in the public forum. Um, but thank you all so much for coming out. Um, really fascinating discussion and to be continued. Thank you so much. Thank you.